اسمحوا لي فقط بأن أقدم على عجالة مدير هذه الجلسة الأستاذ رضا إسلام هو رئيس تنفيذي لأمواج المستقبل المختصة في مجال الاستشارات التقنية ويعمل منذ ثمان سنوات في منظمة رواد الأعمال العالمية التي تهتم بمشاركة الخبرات بين رواد الأعمال على المستوى الدولي شخصيا طبعا عمل المهندس رضا اسلام كمدير للمنظمه في المملكه العربيه السعوديه وهو الان يشغل منصب مدير المنظمه في الشرق الاوسط وايضا في باكستان فالرجاء ان ترحبوا معي بسيد رضا اسلام والمشاركين في هذه الجلسه بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله Growth through youth, this is the theme of this year's forum. During this session, we look at entrepreneurship, what are the challenges <coughs> entrepreneurs face, what enablers are in place to encourage this spirit. Entrepreneurship is not a new concept for us in Saudi Arabia. For hundreds of years, people in the Arabian Peninsula excelled in trade and commerce, building on the opportunities presented by our geographical location and privilege of having the two holy mosques. Why youth? One of the reasons through the last official census puts 58% of the Saudi population under the age of 25. This is a great human capital and a reason for thinking of growth through youth. We can identify the existence of several components of entrepreneurship that causes us to be optimistic and are healthy signs of for the future. Some of these components, like the presence of several entrepreneurial NGOs, both local and international, and the experience, collective experience of their members. Numerous governmental and private sector entrepreneurial initiatives. Innovation and inventions, as we could see evident in some of the Iptikar uh, exhibitions and the number of patents registered every year. And most of our universities, both public and private, have entrepreneurship programs to encourage the entrepreneurial spirit. So we raise the following questions. What are the challenges that entrepreneurs face? Where are we today in building this and stimulating the culture of entrepreneurship and innovation among our youth? What is the role of the GCC governments in developing and supporting the entrepreneurship ecosystem? What support and finance is available to young entrepreneurs? What are the responsibilities across the public and private sector as well as the education system to incubate and facilitate the entrepreneurial spirit? Let us hear from our panelists what they can share with us to help address these questions. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our panel for this discussion. We start with Mr. Abdel Muhsin Al Badr. Abdel Muhsin is the general manager of Prince Ahmed bin Salman Applied Media Academy. He is the founder of D-Links Advisory, a business development advisory. And since 2007, he is the founding member and a board member of Al Ghad Youth Foundation, the first youth NGO in Saudi Arabia. He's also the founder of Invest in Saudi, a company bought later by Saagia in 2005. Abdul Muhsin is a founding member and chief executive officer of the Global Competitiveness Forum from 2006-2011. He started his career in the private sector at Al Mara'i Company in 97. Uh, Abdul Muhsin has two books, Impacts of Globalization on Saudi Arabian Dairy, dairy Industry, with Highlight to Foreign Direct Investment, and The Saudi Company and Social Responsibility. In addition to this, uh, Abdul Muhsin writes for Al Qasadiya and Al Jazeera newspapers. Next, we have Mr. Farid Kurmustaji. Farid has been serving as a managing director of the Mohammed bin Rashid Fund for SME in Dubai, a subsidiary of the Mohammed bin Rashid Establishment for Development of SMEs, mandated to promote entrepreneurship and create a strong growth environment for small and medium enterprises in Dubai. Prior to that, Farid was director of the Entrepreneur Development Department at Dubai SME. He also was in charge of export market development at the Export Development Corporation of Dubai director at the Roads of Transport Authority in Dubai from 2006 to 2008, and a graduate of business administration from the UAE 
UAE University. Mr. Jeremy Liddell. Jeremy Liddell believes entrepreneurial thinking can change the world. He's a speaker, global thought leader, and author specializing in the art of entrepreneurial thinking. As the Australian president for the GG20 Young Entrepreneur Alliance, Jeremy advises world leaders on global best practices in policy and process for entrepreneurship's ecosystems with the intention of creating a positive change and sustainability. By the age of 20, Jeremy was managing the first startup business in booming Australia's juice bar trade, opening Australia's, Australia's number one juice station outlet. In 2005, he co-founded a natural health company called Rio Life, which was named Australia's fastest growing small business in 2010 by Business Magazine. Jeremy is also a TEDx speaker and a keynote, globally, a keynote speaker globally for the G20YEA. He speaks at the United Nations expert group meetings on youth and entrepreneurship and featured in the Southern Media, Shoestring, sorry, Shoestring Media in 2012 Young and Influential List. We have Mr. Gregoire Senchi. He is the chairman and CEO of Next Stage, a company that he co-founded in 2002, a building player in the growth equity investment managing 0.5 billion euros to fund unlisted and listed growth companies in France and EU. Gregoire has been an internet pioneer since 1988. He was the president of Streaming Media, uh, which was taken public on the NASDAQ in 2000 subsequently merged with Market Watch and acquired for half a billion dollars by Dow Jones in 2005. He has been actively involved in promoting entrepreneurship since 2007 and is the co-founder of the G20 Young Entrepreneurs Summit, for which he was the first chairman of the G20 YEA until 2012. He is now chairman of the G20 YEA in France. He's a chairman and co-founder of Citizen Entrepreneur and the Citizenship Week, which is launched in 2007. And he also was one of four experts for the French government during the Entrepreneurship Conference, whose closing was at the Elysee by uh, President Francois Hollande. We have Mr. Chris Hughes. Chris is a social media pioneer. He is the embodiment of today's highest young innovation and uh, represents the forward-thinking entrepreneurship aptly suited for our fast-paced digital world. Best known as one of the co-founders of Facebook, Hughes, along with fellow Harvard roommates, took the simple concept of a student directory and turned it into a multi-billion dollar global phenomenon, setting the template for today's social media landscape and transforming the way the world sends, shares, and disseminates information. After leaving Facebook, Hughes coordinated the online presidential campaign for Barack Obama in 2008, merging the power of social media and politics and redefining the future of political campaigning. He was named uh, the kid who made Obama president by Fast Company magazine. He is the executive director of Jumu, a non-profit social network mag organization which founded in 2010. And since 2012, he is the editor-in-chief and uh, uh, of his uh, both 100-year-old magazine, The New Republic. Thank you.
الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين صباح الخير جميعا أنا حبيت أبدأ بداية مختلفة الشخص اللي واضح في البرزنتيشن اسمه عبد الله سراج عبد الله سراج شاب سعودي عنده طاقة عنده طموح عنده حماس أمس كنت تكلمني يسألني عن موضوع ف. في سياق الحديث قلت له انه انا رايح منتدى جدة الاقتصادي فطلب مني انه ينتج فيلم قصير عن الغد وطبعا انا ما ما اعتقدت شخصيا انه ممكن ينتج في 12 ساعه العمل اللي شفتوه دقيقه و50 ثانيه انتج عبد الله سراج خلال اقل من 12 ساعه حبيت اشكره بالنيابه عنكم ونحيي لانه شاب وله مثال واضح وهذا بداية الحديث عن عن الغد، احنا اليوم جميعنا في المملكة العربية السعودية نمثل مؤسسة الغد. اعتقد انه في شيء في البرزنتيشن بس او الفليب. في خلل في البرزنتيشن. طب عموما على بال ما يصلحوا التكنيكال آه احنا حبينا اليوم لما نشارك في الغد في في منتدى جده حبينا نشارك برساله الغد كمنشاه انشئت قبل ست سنوات كان هدفها الرئيسي تحفيز الشباب في المملكه العربيه السعوديه موضوع رياده الاعمال هاجس لنا جميعا حاولنا نبحث في تحديات رياده الاعمال في المملكه العربيه السعوديه لقينا قدامكم عشر أمثلة لتحديات تواجه ريادة الأعمال في المملكة أعتقد أن في عشرات غير هذه التحديات وإحنا جمعنا تحديات كثيرة في في عناصر معينة بلد بهالحجم التمويل ومخاطر التمويل أصبحت أقل الإجراءات الحكومية اليوم أصبحت أسهل المهارات الأساسية في جهود كبيرة الحمد لله موجودة دخول المبادرين السعوديين في مسابقات عالمية وربحهم هذا شيء موجود احنا ننظر للموضوع بشكل بشكل مختلف تاريخيا رياده الاعمال ما كانت تحدي في تاريخ المملكه العربيه السعوديه على مستوى الافراد واحنا اليوم اخذنا امثله بسيطه على نماذج الامبراطوريات اعمال اليوم نشوفها بداها مبادرون سعوديون في وقت ما كان في اجراءات حكوميه ما كان في تمويل ذكي ما كان في تحفيز ما كان في تعليم ما كان في تدريب هذا يعطينا على الاقل ملخص او 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 نقطه رئيسيه ان الاشكاليه ما هي في الـ في الـ في الـ يعني ما هي في الايكو سيستم اللي هو التنظيمي والاجرائي وراس المال احنا نظرتنا ان الاشكاليه هي في الافراد انا اخذت سلايد من من انديفر وانديفر تركز على الهاي امباكت انتربرنور شيب و وسووا هم دراسه في العام 2013 علشان يشوفوا وين التحديات بالضبط اللي تواجه المبادرين في الاميرجنج ايكونوميز او في الاميرجنج ماركتس ومنها المملكه العربيه السعوديه وطلعوا بخمسه سته اشياء لم يكن منها الاجراءات الحكوميه او السوق كانت تتركز على المبادر على شخص المبادر وهي نقاط اساسيه ما هي نقاط لها علاقه بالتنظيم الحكومي او او بالتمويل باستثناء التمويل الذكي. فاحنا اختصرناها في في نقاط تتحدث تحديدا عن نشر ثقافه رياده الاعمال في المملكه العربيه السعوديه، وجدنا انها تدور حول الافراد. لذلك المجتمع اليوم تكلفه الفشل للمبادر عاليه. مع الاسف المجتمع احيانا ما يرحم المبادر اذا اذا خسر واذا اذا فتح بزنس وما قدر يكمل فيه. غياب النماذج الملهمة كان جزء من الدراسة ضعف الخبرة الإدارية غياب العلاقات مع خلينا نقول مع الملهمين غياب الثقة حتى الناس ما تثق في المنتج اللي ينتجه شاب سعودي وضعف التمويل الذكي كثير من المشاكل اللي اللي ذكرناها في الأول انتهت وانتهت ليش انتهت لأنه الأشخاص اللي مسكوا قيادات وزارات حكومية كان عندهم حس الانتربرنور شيب لذلك راينا تغيير في بعض الوزارات فالانتربرنور شيب اليوم ما هو بزنس انتربرنور شيب ما هو رياده اعمال هي رياده اعمال اجتماعيه ورياده اعمال تجاريه ورياده اعمال حكوميه لذلك راينا في تحول في بعض الوزارات يثبت 
أن الشخص هو من يصنع التغيير وليس المحيط أو الإيكو سيستم اللي موجود عشان كذا احنا في الغد من البداية نركز على أنه تحفيز الشباب إعطائهم الفرصة هو المدخل الرئيسي لنشر ثقافة ريادة الأعمال في المملكة العربية السعودية وهذه رؤية مؤسسة الغد أن نكون محرك رئيسي في تهيئة بيئة مناسبة ومحفزة للشباب السعودي للمشاركة في التنمية المستدامة ولا نقصد تحديدا ريادة الأعمال ولكن نعمل أن نجهز الشباب لمرحلة ريادة الأعمال ولذلك القيم اللي, اللي احنا نشتغل عليها هي القيم اللي انتم شفتوها في الفيديو احنا لنا ست سنوات واحنا نعمل على ان نضع ستيج مثل هذا للشباب يطلعوا يتكلموا عليه ويقولوا افكارهم اعطيناهم الفرصة والمجال يتكلموا مع قيادات حكومية خرجنا بمبادرات تلهم عندنا مشاريع مثل, مثل تدكس الرياض تدكس الرياض كان منتج يحضره 1700 شاب وشابة همهم الرئيسي يتعلموا من 18 متحدث أو ملهم يطلعوا على الستيج لدينا مبادرة اسمها قافلة الغد نأخذ 52 شاب وشابة من جميع مناطق المملكة ونحاول نقل التجارب الناجحة تواصلنا مع أمارات المناطق كان لنا تأثير في بعض المناطق بحيث استحدث مجالس للشباب والهدف الرئيسي هو زرع الثقة فيهم وأعطاهم المساحة وبإذن الله البلد هذه سترى الخير بشبابها لأن هم اللي يصنعون المستقبل هذه نماذج بسيطة على كيف احنا نعمل عندنا ورش عمل وعندنا مشاريع مشتركة عندنا دراسات وعندنا تحفيز والهام وكله ابتدى قبل انا ما اروح كله ابتدى بفكرة سيدة رأت ان من واجبها الوطني انها تحفز شباب البلد وانا باسمكم الان قبل ما اروح للسلايد الاخير احب اشكر الاميرة نوف بنت فيصل بن تركي هي موجودة معانا اليوم هي اللي بدت المشروع وهي اللي تكمل اليوم معانا وأنا أفخر أنه يكون رئيس مجلس إدارة منشأة مثل هذه هي سيدة فهذه إضافة أخرى فأنا أشكر لها جهودها وهي لا زالت متحمسة أنها تضع الكثير فأحنا عندنا القناعة في الغد والجهد والعزيمة أن ثقافة المبادرة هي التي يجب أن تنتشر في المملكة العربية السعودية وهي اللي ستقود المستقبل أبترككم مع سؤال أخير تفكروا فيه وهذا السؤال طرحته أرنستان يونغ في تقرير انتربنور سبيك اوت اللي رفع لقادة قمة العشرين وكان السؤال على تحديدا هذا السؤال سؤل لمبادرين سعوديين والسؤال كان هل تعتقد ان الثقافة في مجتمعك تدعم ريادة الاعمال انتم فكروا هل فعلا في نسبة عندنا كبيرة انا بترك ابحط الجواب وانا عندي شخصية تحفظات كثيرة على الرقم 86% من الانتربنوز اللي قابلتهم بارنستان يانج قالوا إنه المجتمع السعودي أو الثقافة المجتمع السعودي تدعم ريادة الأعمال أنا بترك لكم الحكم فيما يخص هالنسبة وأعتقد إنه في سؤال خلال الجلسة يتعلق بدراسات استحدثت بعد هذه الدراسة اللي سويت في 2011 أعتقد أن العمل يجب أن يبدأ من الأفراد ونحن في الغد نلتزم ونرحب بأي شراكة تدعم شباب هذا الوطن أشكر لمنتدى جدا الاقتصادي تاحة الفرصة لنا وتطلع إلى نقاش مثري في هذه الجلسة شكرا, شكرا جزيلا لك شكرا أنا عبد المحصف أخ فريد لا أنت ما تحتاج لا ما أحتاج كيف التايمينج بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أصحاب المعالي والسعادة السيدات والسادة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بداية أود أن أشكر رئيس غرفة جدة رئيس منتدى جدة الاقتصادي على دعوتهم لنا للمشاركة في هذا المنتدى الناجح وخلال الدقائق القادمة إن شاء الله سأستعرض معكم تجربة مؤسسة محمد بن راشد لتنمية المشاريع الصغيرة والمتوسطة في دبي لنشر الفكر الريادي في إمارة دبي في الحقيقة تقدم مؤسسة محمد بن راشد خدماتها لجميع فئات المجتمع الإماراتي بمختلف أعمارهم فهي قامت بالتعاون مع وزارة التربية والتعليم في تطوير منهج تعليمي لنشر الفكر الريادي بين طلبة المدارس ريادة الأعمال شيء لا يمكن أن الواحد يعني يفكر فيه وهو كبير إذا ما كان هذا الشيء مارسه وتجربه في خلال مستوياته العمرية المختلفة 
فبصراحة نحن في في دبي عندنا مبادرات كثيرة منها أعتقد حد منكم يمكن شاف مبادرة اسمها التاجر الصغير هذه مبادرة نسويها لطلبة المدارس وتكون في إحدى المراكز التجارية وتكون سنوية فنسوي نوعا ما مثل أكشاك نوزع على على الطلبة اللي عندهم أفكار تجارية لممارسة التجارة في السوق في مثلهم مثل باقي التجار الكبار الفكرة مو في نوعية المنتج اللي هم يبيعونه بس الفكرة في أنه يبدأ يفكر كيف يشتري ويبيع ويتفاوض ويتعلم مهارات التجارة يعني هذه طبعا لطلبة المدارس أيضا في عنا مبادرة أخرى مع كيتزانيا كيتزانيا إحدى المؤسسات الرائدة طبعا أكيد تعرفونها مقرها المكسيك في لها فرع في دبي في دبي مول احنا بعد وقعنا اتفاقية تعاون معهم وادخلنا قسم جديد لتعليم ريادة الاعمال لطل... لل... لل... للاطفال اللي هم يدخلون كتزانية ويلعبون هناك ففي بصراحة الكثير من المبادرات اللي تعلم الاطفال كيف يمارسون العمل كوظيفة فنحن ادخلنا على كل التجارب اللي هم عندهم الجزئية المتعلقة بتعليمهم ريادة الأعمال وكيفية ممارسة التجارة هذه طبعا بالنسبة للأطفال بالنسبة للكبار في عنا جائزة الشيخ محمد بن راشد للأعمال اللي هي تكون تشجع المشاريع المتميزة سنويا وأيضا تشجع الجهات والمؤسسات الحكومية الداعمة لهذه المشاريع الصغيرة والمتوسطة وإن شاء الله خلال البرزنتيشن سأستعرض عليكم بعض الخدمات اللي أو بعض البرامج اللي عندنا اللي تصب في دعم استمرارية المشاريع الصغيرة والمتوسطة عندما بدأنا بدأنا المؤسسة قبل حوالي 12 سنة واجهنا بصراحة مشكلة أن الكثير من المواطنين كانت عندهم أفكار تجارية ولكن في نفس الوقت كان عندهم الخوف من بدء هذا المشروع لأنهم كانوا يخافون من الفشل فهذه طبعا حقيقة وواقع يجب التعامل معها الكثيرين منا اليوم يريد أن يبدأ مشروعه وعند الفكرة ولكن يريد من يشجعه ويدفعه إلى خوض التجربة الأولى فالخوف من الفشل هذه أكبر أكبر يعني سبب يخلي الناس ما تبدأ المشروع فاللي عملناه نحن أطلقنا مبادرة باسم برنامج انطلاق اللي تم من خلاله ترخيص كل الأفكار المنزلية وإعطاها الإطار, الإطار القانوني للعمل من المنزل فأصبح يعني اللي عند الفكرة بدلا ما أنه يأجر محل ويعمل الديكور ويجيب عمالة ويعني يصرف الكثير قلنا لا ما عليه احنا بنعطيك الرخصة وانت مارس العمل اللي انت في بالك من المنزل اذا شفت الفكرة مجدية وحصلت على اقبال الناس بعدين ممكن تتوسع بعد ثلاث سنوات فاعطيناه الفرصة لمدة ثلاث سنوات ان يجرب المشروع والحمد لله في كثيرين نجحوا وتطورت مشاريعهم إلى مشاريع فعلية في في بعد, بعد ثلاث سنوات أو في كثيرين منهم أيضا في أقل من ثلاث سنوات يعني حصل على الثقة وال 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 وتعلم شو المطلوب وحسن المنتج اللي عنده وقدر يطلع برا في عنا في المؤسسة برامج تعمل على تطوير تنمية قطاع الأعمال في دبي من هذه البرامج في عن أو من هذه الخدمات خدمات استشارية وتدريبية فنحن عنا جلسات استشارية فردية مع كل شخص يفكر في إنه يبدأ مشروع صغير في دبي نعلم هذا الشخص كيف إجراءات الرخصة شو الطلبات شو ممكن يسوي كيف يعد يعد خطة العمل كيف تسوي دراسة جدوى الأمور المبادئ خلنا نقول مبادئ التجارة وأيضا إذا شفنا أنه محتاج في عنا أيضا دورات تدريبية لتأهيل هؤلاء الشباب فنرشحهم لدخول الدورات في المجالات اللي هم نحس أنهم يحتاجون إلى تقوية فيها مثل مثلا مجال التسويق مجال الموارد البشرية مجال الإدارة في عنا طبعا مجالات مختلفة 
لضيق الوقت صراحة ما أقدر أدخل في تفاصيلها في أيضا عندنا خدمات تهدف إلى تقليل تكاليف تأسيس المشروع في إمارة دبي مثل ما تعرفون يعني يمكن إحنا عندنا الإيجارات شوي أغلى من 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 الأماكن الثانية عندنا ديكور مكلف عندنا الأيدي العاملة شوي غالية ف جينا قلنا لهم خلاص نحن بنعفيكم عن رسوم الرخصة لأول ثلاث سنوات فالشاب المواطن اليوم لما يريد يفتح مشروعه في دبي نعفيه عن كل الرسوم اللي المفروض أي تاجر يدفعها لممارسة عمله التجاري في دبي وهذا طبعا يعني مساعده جدا متميزه حق الشاب لانه يعني في البدايه انت حتى لو توفر عليه 5000 درهم بالنسبه له مبلغ كبير. بعدين عملنا اتفاقيات تعاون مع جهات حكوميه وشبه حكوميه اللي هي تملك العقارات يعني منها مثلا جهه اسمها وصل العقاريه. وصل العقاريه هي الجهه اللي تدير كل العقارات التابعه لحكومه دبي. وايضا في جهات اخرى عندها تملك الكثير من العقارات فالمؤسسه عملت اتفاقيات تعاون معاهم لاعطاء اسعار تفضيليه لهذه لهؤلاء الشباب اللي يتحولون من طرفنا وايضا لاعطائهم الافضليه في التاجير فمثلا اذا كان في عندنا شخصين واحد محول من المؤسسه وواحد ثاني عادي من من خارج المؤسسه هم يفضلوا يعطوا المحل او المكتب للشخص المحول من المؤسسه وبتخفيض وبتخفيض يتراوح بين 20% الى 30% من قيمه الايجار. طبعا هذه بعد يعني دعم كبير لهم في بدايه مشوارهم التجاري. ايضا في عندنا حاضنه الاعمال التجاريه اللي في عندنا تقريبا يعني كان كانت في حاضنه وهي الحاضنه ما شاء الله يعني الاقبال زاد عليها حاليا ما فيها ولا مكتب فاحنا توسعنا فيها وعملنا حاضنه ثانيه بضعف المساحه اليوم عندنا 80 مكتب او 82 مكتب مؤثث جاهز للعمل في اي وقت يجينا المواطن ممكن على طول اليوم الثاني يجيب اللابتوب ماله ويبدا يمارس عمله التجاري من دبي بالنسبة لخدمات التمويل طبعا هي ضرورية يعني مثل ما تعرفون احنا في كل الدراسات اللي نسويها دائما الشباب يمكن يواجهون مشكلة التمويل بس الكثير منهم يعتقد ان اذا انحلت المشكلة هذه خلاص انحلت كل المشاكل ولكن لا هذا بداية المشوار ف البداية تكون دائما بالتمويل وعند الافتتاح أو بعد ما يبدأ المشروع تأتي مشكلة التسويق لأن الناس ما تثق فيهم فنحن عملنا لهم في البداية خدمة لتمويل المشاريع الصغيرة في عنا نوعين من القروض في عنا قرض اسمه قرض التأسيس هذا القرض يبدأ من عشرة آلاف درهم إلى مئتين وخمسين ألف درهم ويكون بدون أرباح هذه تكون للمشاريع الصغيرة أو المتناهية الصغر اللي محتاجة إلى رأس مال سريع ممكن تأخذ المبلغ هذا تشتري فيه تدخل في صفقة يعني ك ك يعني تمويل سريع ممكن نقرض إياه ويمكن رد هذا المبلغ في خلال السبع سنوات قادمة يعني مدة السداد مدة إعادة المبلغ. وايضا في عندنا القرض الرئيسي اللي هو من 250 الف درهم الى مبلغ 3 ملايين درهم وهذا يكون لاصحاب لاصحاب الافكار او حتى الناس اللي عندهم مشاريع في دبي ويريدوا تطوير هاي المشاريع بالتوسع او بفتح فروع جديده او فتح خط انتاج جديد فهذه نوع ثاني من القروض كل القروض هذه الحمد لله نحن نحاول ان ننتهي من 80% من الطلبات هاي خلال شهر لان نحن عندنا قناعه ان دائما التجاره هي تكون عباره عن فرصه سوقيه 
فانت اذا جاك الشاب طلب منك خلينا نقول القرض وانت اخرت ست شهور ربما الفرصه هذه تروح لحد ثاني او حد ثاني يكون اشطر منه. فالسرعه فالسرعه في التجاوب مع مثل هذه الطلبات جدا يعني ضروريه. في السابق مثل ما تعرفون يمكن كان الكبير دائما ياكل الصغير، اليوم السريع ياكل البطيء. فلازم نكون سريعين جدا في تنفيذ افكارنا. استاذ فريد شكرا يعني حبيب بس بس شوي بس الجزئيه هذه بس جزئيه المشتريات بس ما اطول. تفضل. بارك الله فيك. لدينا بصراحه خدمات اخرى تصب في مجال ضمان استمراريه المشاريع، بعد ما اسسنا المشروع وقللنا تكلفه التاسيس ومولناه نريد نضمن استمرارية المشروع لأن أنت قد ما تعطيه فلوس إذا السوق ما يثق فيه وما يعطوه شغل هذا الشخص ما يقدر يستمر لأن قد ما أنت عطيته التكاليف الثابتة تأكل فلوسه وفي يوم من الأيام بتشوفه خارج السوق فسيدي صاحب سمو الشيخ محمد بن راشد أصدر قانونين أو مرسومين وحدة على المستوى المحلي والثاني على المستوى الاتحادي وهذيل المرسومين يعني يأمرون الجهات الحكومية وشبه الحكومية التي تملك فيها حكومة دبي ما نسبته خمسين في المية أو أكثر من الأسهم أن تقوم بإعطاء خمسة في المية من ميزانية مشترياتها السنوية لأعضاء المشاريع الصغيرة والمتوسطة المسجلين عندنا نحن في المؤسسة. فهذا بصراحة دعم كبير للشباب وأصدر قانون ثاني للوزارات الاتحادية واللي تفرض عليهم إعطاء عشرة في المية من مشترياتهم السنوية لمشاريع للمشاريع الصغيرة والمتوسطة المسجلة في مؤسسات الدعم وأيضا نحن نحاول نشركهم في المعارض والمؤتمرات ونروجهم ونروج نروج لمشاريعهم في الكثير من المحافل الدولية. وهذا كله يبني لهم الثقة وتعطيهم القدرة على الاستمرارية في السوق بارك الله فيكم ونتمنى التوفيق للجميع أحسنت أخ فريد سجان Thank you Now we had a video and uh, we unfortunately don't have it. However, I will be speaking again at, uh, at 1 p.m. over lunch. So if anyone would like to join to, to listen to that, please do. Um, I'm sure that I don't have to say this, but I'm going to reiter reiterate some statistics around unemployment that are fairly shocking. Um, there are 1.8 billion youth in the world right now, a quarter of the world's population. 87% of them live in developing countries and two-thirds of them are underutilized, so they're not in full-time education or employment. 1.2 billion youth that don't know how they're going to put food on the table in the foreseeable future due to being underemployed. Now, this is a huge problem. Now, it's not just reserved for the developing countries. In the EU, from 2008 to 2012, youth unemployment increased by 24.9%. And even in Australia, one of the most robust economies in the world, one in four youth right now, so those aged 15 to 24, are not in full-time education or employment. This is a big problem, and is a problem that I propose that entrepreneurial thinking and ecosystems, that entrepreneurship is the solution to. And I must commend Sheikh Saleh and the Jeddah, the Jeddah Chamber for putting on such a fantastic event and all of the initiatives that are happening around entrepreneurship in the kingdom and in this region. It's, it's fantastic and very exciting. And I commend everyone in this room for coming and being a part of the solution. And I really hope that everyone can come out of these sessions empowered to make an impact in your ecosystem to help the youth and to create a better world for everybody. Now, is this working? 
If we can shift to the next slide, I'm trying to go, but it's not working. Um, I'm, I'm here representing the G20 Young Entrepreneurs Alliance. We're hosting a summit in Australia on the 18th of July, and I would encourage every young entrepreneur in the room to please come and apply to join us in Sydney. Um, the, again, I can commend um, the Prince Abdulaziz bin Abdullah for founding the initiative called the Centennial Fund, a fantastic organisation here. They're the G20 Young Entrepreneurs Alliance member in the kingdom, and they'll be bringing a delegation from the GCC region to Sydney on the 18th of July. So please do apply to come and be a part of the, the discussion on a global scale around what we can do to help young entrepreneurs. If we can go to the next slide. Yep. Down. Gotcha. So, I've been running companies for about 13 years and I've discovered a concept that I believe defines entrepreneurship. It's very, very simple. It starts with identifying a problem. The great entrepreneurs identify what some might call a gap in the market or a problem. They create a sustainable commercial solution to that problem. They then figure out who values that problem? What is their target market? Because if no one values the solution, then you're not going to have a business. They then take action, and the cycle continues. Now, this is a process of entrepreneurship. What is critical to entrepreneurship is the mindset. Success begins and ends in your mind. So when you run a company, you inherently learn these, that pro these mindsets. But these mindsets can be educated. Peter Drucker says that entrepreneurs are not born, they're made. You can teach this. So entrepreneurs are passionate, inspired, and energetic. They're empowered and confident enough to take opportunities. They have an ownership mentality. They're fast decision makers and risk takers. They're leaders. When you run a company, you inherently must become a leader. They're disciplined and hardworking and they constantly are learning, they're adaptive, and they're dynamic. My proposal is that this concept has the potential to fundamentally change the world in two ways. The first is if you can foster this mindset, you shift the way people think. You can shift the way that your youth and your children think. And when you think with these mindsets, it creates an elevated approach to life. They become more engaged citizens. They, came, they become better employees. They're going to look for problems in society and try and solve them commercially and sustainably. They're not going to be looking for handouts anymore. They're going to be out there creating change in the world. The second, one, the second way that this can change the world is that if you create ecosystems that foster entrepreneurship, then you can actually lift societies out of poverty and you can solve the youth employment crisis because when you create ecosystems, you create more jobs. You create people that will create jobs for themselves and hopefully go on to create high growth enterprises that create jobs for hundreds of other people. And there's a lot of data that backs this concept up. So the next concept I'm going to present is that of an entrepreneurship ecosystem. In this analogy, the ecosystem is like your economy. The trees are the entrepreneurs or the businesses. An ecosystem or a business, a, a tree starts with an idea which is like a seed. A seed must be planted into a bed of innovation and technology. This idea then needs to be watered with access to capital. So these are, the, these are our six pillars of entrepreneurship ecosystems that we talk, around, talk about at the G20 Young Entrepreneurs Alliance. So you have a great idea, you make it innovative, or you make it technology enabled, you water it with access to capital. The sun is like education and coordinated support. It doesn't matter how fantastic an idea is and how much money you throw at it. If the entrepreneur doesn't know what they're doing, then it won't work. The next are like the animals in the ecosystem are the government. The government can either be incredibly facilitative and create an environment that fosters a better ecosystem, or they can constrain it. The fifth pillar is entrepreneurship culture, much like the ethereal uh, concept of an atmosphere. All of the elements of the, all the other pillars create a culture. It's the, the culture is what the parents teach their children, what teachers te tell their children about entrepreneurship, what's said in the media. There's a whole, uh, many elements which I'm going to run through very quickly. The final pillar is trade and globalization. So what are some of the elements in, an ecos in the innovation and technology sector? R&D, ease of commercialization, digital infrastructure, 
major universities as catalysts. A lot of the, the, the next Facebook might be sitting in an engineer's, in a, in, in a computer engineer or a software engineer's university project right now, waiting to be commercialized. So what are the universities doing to, to promote entrepreneurship? The next pillar is access to capital. I affectionately, and in Australia we use the triple F fund, we call affectionately friends, fools and family, who are going to fund a business before it's commercial, when it's just an idea. Angel investors, access to debt, private equity, venture capital, and what we in Australia call superannuation funds. Then in education and coordinated support. Entrepreneur specific training, private and NGO programs, mentors and advisors, professional services firms, incubators which the king kingdom is spawning a lot of, all of these things contribute to the, eco to the education and coordinated support pillar. And then the human capital element. If a company, if an entrepreneur creates a business that is going to become a high growth enterprise, can they hire the staff, the, the quality people that they need in order to grow that business? In taxation and regulation, it's really about making it easy. And I've got one recommendation in each of these pillars which I'm going to go to first, yeah, uh, next. Tax incentives, business-friendly legislation, digital infrastructure, affordable digi digital infrastructure, access to transport. They're all things that can be addressed with policy. Then culture, Chris touched on this, tolerance of risk and failure, making it all right for our children to go out there and do something wrong and then encourage them to pick themselves up and do something again. Because if not, people aren't willing to make a mistake and they're not going to be supported out of the back of a mistake, then they're going to be constrained in, in their willingness to go and try something entrepreneurial, to find, and find something new and try and commercialize it. So the preference for self-employment, success stories, you know, success stories in media are really important. Research and culture, a positive uh, image, and celebration of in innovation. I went to the Olympiad, the National uh, Science Olympiad in, in Riyadh before coming here, and wow, your youth are incredibly impressive. They are coming up with some amazing ideas. One young, uh, young boy came up with an idea to turn uh, paper recycling and other secondhand products into bricks that cost half as much as a normal brick and are also insulation, they, they're heat resistant. This guy was about 12 years old. That's a business of the future, and that's a Saudi innovation. So commercializing those ideas, amazing. The talent's here. You guys have everything you need, but it's mindset. It's all about getting out there, taking ownership of what you're going to do, creating your own future. Peter Drucker says that the best way to predict the future is to create it. Final one's trade and globalization. So access to markets, free trade agreements, subsidies and tariffs. If, you're, if, if other countries are constraining trade or if Saudi is constraining trade, that's a, that's a barrier for entrepreneurship. And then what, what access to big customers are there? If someone creates a new enterprise, can they sell that to the government? Can they sell that to big business? Can they, is it easy to sell it to small business? Some statistics very quickly. The World Economic Forum, Stanford and Endeavor did a study of 380,000 uh, companies in 10 countries. And they proved that the top 5% of companies defined by the rate of growth of jobs contributed to 72% of the country's aggr to aggregate total revenue and 67% of the total jobs. And they're characterized by being young and presenting high rates of growth. Young firms, it's all about firms younger than five years old and startups that are creating all the jobs around the world. There's reams and pages and books of, of data that support this information. And you guys have heard a lot about it today. The OECD, education. In order to strengthen entrepreneurial abilities, teaching methods must be redefined from primary schools to universities. Activities that go beyond traditional teaching, such as dedicated entrepreneurship centers, internships, teacher and advisory education, and increasing an entrepreneurial mindset. This isn't just our opinion. This is the opinion of all the leading organizations around the world. You need to focus on entrepreneurship and education. Entrepreneurs are made, not born. And it can be taught like any other discipline. Entrepreneurship is a skill. Of course, there's going to be some people that are naturally more apt and more talented. However, it's a skill that can be taught, like any other skill. 
So here's, here's some of the organizations that are promoting this idea. Now, some specific recommendations that we can do in the kingdom here and that I hope that will impact everyone in this room. I've heard a lot of uh, conversation around what government should do. It's not just government's role, it's everybody's role. Everyone in this room can have an impact. So what, what can we all do and what should we all do? From, based on my experience and the time that I've spent in the kingdom, I've, I've chosen these out of all of the recommendations that the Alliance makes to the world leaders. So in the innovation and technology pillar, there's this fantastic concept called free access IP, where universities, instead of making it very difficult and making it complicated for companies to come and commercialize their technology, they give it away for free. In return for branding, and it's incredibly impactful. So for anyone that's representing a university here, you can go back and say, hey, all of this research and development that's happening here, let's give it away to our young entrepreneurs, let's give it away to our businesses, but make them sign a contract where everywhere, anywhere they use that intellectual property, it promotes the university. The net effect of this, it started in Glasgow University and it's been adopted by about 40 universities around the world now. What they're finding is the net effect is the university actually makes more money because they get research and development contracts from the organizations that are using their IP. Access to capital. From what I've seen in the kingdom here, I think there's a huge opportunity for those that have some money to invest in your youth, back your children, back your children's friends, encourage them to start businesses and invest in them. Entrepreneur, experiential entrepreneur education should be throughout the school curriculum. From as early as you can start, five to 10 years old, there's programs that are, that are uh, have proven to be successful around the world, all the way through to universities, should be ingrained nationally. That the, the thing that I find quite ironic about this is that, you know, I feel incredibly humbled as an Australian to be flown over here to talk about entrepreneurship. However, I'm talking to a society that was built on merchants and traders. Entrepreneurship's in your DNA. You guys, you guys are one of the countries that founded entrepreneurship under another guise. It's almost like we just need to rediscover it and get it back into the teaching of the children. In taxation and regulation, I think that the most impactful thing that government can do is just make it easy. Just get out of the way. Make, make it easier, less red, we call it red tape in Australia. Just allow the entrepreneurs to do what they do and make it easy for them and don't constrain them. In culture, the media, the media in this room, the media that have come, profile entrepreneurs put the stories out there, make aspirations. And in trade and globalization, e-commerce obviously is, is critical to this. So banks installing more e-commerce platforms and promoting uh, platforms like PayPal are incredibly impactful. So that's it from me. I hope I haven't gone too far over time. Thank you very much, as, you very I, much as I mentioned. Thank I'm you. talking at lunch. Thank you. Thank you. Gregoire. Bonjour. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank His uh, Royal Highness and uh, uh, Sheikh Hamel, Hamel for the chairman of the DCC. As well, I've been having the privilege to be uh, a guest in the kingdom for the last 10 years and to come on a regular basis uh, here in the kingdom. And I've learned a lot. Uh, and I'd like to share back with you, uh, first of all, the vision about what's going on about uh, that world which is rapidly emerging through the emergence of the third industrial revolution, uh, to talk to you about some data about why and how we can cope with the youth and the female and employment uh, challenge, and why are youth and female pivotal in, uh, in the way to address the challenge of the job creation. Waiting for the. Can I get some support? Sorry. Is there somebody? Um, well, in waiting for. 
the PowerPoint to, to work. Uh, the vision that I want to share with you was inspired uh, by uh, the thinking developed 100 years ago by the, the economist Joseph Schumpeter, who coined the concept of the creative destruction. Um, and what I want to share with you is the, the vision about the tree of the, world, the whole world economy, which is being radically reshaped at the moment at the speed which is unprecedented. And Chris Hughes mentioned that, but I'd like to share with you some perspectives on that. Um, if you step back, the first industrial revolution took 400 years to happen uh, between 1455 and the middle of the 19th century. And industrial revolution always happen when you have at the same time the emergence of new ways of communication. That was the printing with Gutenberg. And then step by step at the same time, we found out about uh, the coal as being a major source of uh, production of energy. And this is what drove the emergence of uh, the industrial revolution in the textile uh, uh, business. And that's how step by step it started to emerge out of Europe. Um, then we, uh, and it took 400 years to happen. Then at the beginning, at the middle, in the middle of the 19th century, we started to see the first mass media emerging, and that was uh, the newspapers, and then we had the radio, and then the movie industry, and then the TV industry, the TV broadcast industry. And at the same time, uh, at the end of the 19th century, we started to see the emergence of the oil as a resource, and we know about that here in the kingdom, as well as electricity with Thomas Edison. And this is what shaped the emergence of the second industrial revolution, uh, where Henry Ford showed that it was about all uh, structuring, terrorizing, ter terrorizing the uh, industrial organization, with the, which was driven by the industrial offering that was mass production, mass media, and mass consumption. And it took and it fueled the growth of the whole world for the last 150 years between 1850 and 1995. And in 1995, um, um, we started to see the emergence of the internet. In 1994, there was zero internet users all over the world. In 2010, now we have one billion, we had one billion internet users through fixed line. By 2015, there will be six billion internet users through the mobile and, and the, the tablets. And by 2020, that there will be 35 billion IoT, Internet of Things, which will be connected. And this is happening in less than 20 years. And at the same time, information, energy is becoming like information, something that we use, something that we produce, something that we share, and something that we inventory. And the shale gas, which did not exist five years ago, um, is now putting the U.S. in the position to be the number one uh, worldwide producer in the energy uh, market. And this is driving the emergence of those new sources of energies and uh, of uh, information are driving the emergence of a new industrial model, which is driven not by the offering, but which is driven by the demand. And typically, those organizations are much more collaborative, global, flat, and uh, much less uh, ver vertical and much more uh, horizontal. And entrepreneurs and uh, uh, the uh, entrepreneurs are playing a key role in the emergence of that. And this, the difference is that it's happening in 20 years, where the present industrial revolution happened in 150 years and the one before in 400 years. And at the same time, we are experiencing three major demographic, social, and environmental disruptions. And at the same time, on top of that, we are experiencing three major technology disruptions, the one around information technology, the one around, around life science, and the one around the technology energy revolution. And this is driving the emergence of the whole new model, which is, where, which is fully driven by demand, 
and when the whole new value chain is about what I call an emotion-led economy. It's an emotion-led economy where the value of experience and the value of the brand is key. And behind that, you have the industry on demand and the internet industrial, which are reshaping all the services and manufacturing industry. And at the top of that, you have the key, which is uh, how do we qualitatively optimize the, optim the, re the natural resources uh, exploitation. And this is what's, what's happening at the moment, and that is happening at the speed of light. We are living uh, through uh, a moment which is a perfect moment of creative disruption, which is happening in less than 20 years. And to give you a perspective, uh, the major markets going forwards will be, if you talk about that in terms of tens of, uh, of uh, in terms of thousands of billion dollars, you're in a situation where the biggest part of the market for the next 10 years, and it's a 10 trillion dollars market, will be the additional number of uh, middle class customers all over the world. And the one after immediately is about health, uh, healthcare and aging, and the one after is about uh, education. And why is that important in the perspective of what we are talking about today? It's key because it shows that youth and female well, uh, youth and female are uh, a major part uh, of the population, and we are in a situation where now we can foresee that on a regional basis, as well as, as on a country basis, we are in a situation where the GCC region has the highest level worldwide in terms of youth unemployment. And we can see that uh, social instability is deeply linked with the ability to get the young people to integrate socially and economically in the society. And we are now in a situation uh, Chris was mentioning that 58% of the population here in the kingdom uh, is below the age of uh, uh, 25 years. In Africa, this goes up to 65% of the population. And it is crystal clear now for both governments and economists that this challenge will not be uh, addressed by governments or existing corporations to provide the jobs for the waves of youth people, youth generations arriving on the market. This can only be addressed by the ability to put the youth and the female. When we talk about um, uh, an emotion-led economy, you can see how important it is to get to put the youth people and, uh, and uh, the female in a position to be the entrepreneurs of their own destinies. They are the agent of change. They are the agent of change. And now, if you look at what can be and what should be the role and the opportunities for, of entrepreneurs within the 21st century economy, it's about first to put them in a position to design and to build the new players of the 21st uh, economy, both in developed and in developing countries. The second point is to put them in a position to create the jobs. Um, I'll share with you two figures. In Europe, 85% of the jobs over the last 20 years have been created by entrepreneurs, 85%. And in that perspective, 57% of the jobs which were created were created by uh, the fastest growing, the 5% fastest growing entrepreneurs and small and medium sized companies, which means that the challenge is not only about putting the youth people in a position to become entrepreneurs, it's about putting them in a position to grow their business. Because 5% of them represent close to two-thirds of the job creation. Then what is key, and that's the third point, is to foster hope uh, for the youth generation. When you have 25, 30% of the youth population which is not able to integrate uh, within the economy, then you create a potential situation for, for challenges and, and social uh, protests. And that has been experienced not only in the Arabic world, but all over the world, from the Occupy Wall Street to 
the Ignados in, uh, in Spain, in France, in the UK uh, as well. And that brings me to the, my last point, which is putting the youth and the female uh, and the women in the position to be the entrepreneurs of our own destiny is bringing the requested agility to the developed uh, economies to adapt because some of them are old and need to deeply adapt. And this is true for all the developed economies and for the developing countries and for the developing economies uh, to build the innovative and economic infrastructure. They are the ones who are going to build them, who are going to build it. Uh, and Jack, if we well, don't put I'm, them... I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you yeah. off because we're running very short yeah. of time. And, so. and this is what I wanted to, to share with you. This is, uh, this is a shared experience, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Chris, we'd like to hear from you. I'll be very brief. Thank you. I'll be very brief since I've already occupied uh, so much of your time already this morning. Try to do it in uh, less than five minutes. I'd just like to try to summarize a lot of the things that I think um, we've heard from, from uh, several folks up here and that I was trying to share earlier and then break it down into a really specific, uh, really specific idea or recommendation before we go into a brief question and answer period. The first is, on the level of policy, it is incredibly clear that there is much to learn from what's happened in Dubai and in some of the most successful economies across the globe that you have to make it as easy as possible for entrepreneurship to happen. It should be a prerequisite that legal structures that make it more difficult for new uh, uh, businesses to, to be created should be simplified. Fees and any kind of financial barriers that make it difficult for people to enter into uh, or create new businesses should be significantly reduced if not eradicated altogether. The first priority should be lowering those legal and financial barriers so that all of the other challenges that we face, we can work on those together. Second is the role of education, whether it's you know, liberal arts and critical thinking or you know, very specific entrepreneurial education as uh, several members of the, of the group up here have talked about. It has to be something that's focused on and thought carefully about the kind of education that suited the world in Saudi Arabia in the 19th and 20th centuries and, and for the United States and Europe as well is just not going to cut it if we want to encourage entrepreneurship in the 21st. The third is diversity. I mean, it is incredibly clear that there is you know, a growing wave of young people and a growing wave of people who, who uh, of, of, of all classes, of both genders, who want to participate in the economy and embracing that is only going to strengthen, strengthen uh, the effort. To be really specific before opening up for questions, I would highly encourage those of you who lead the Saudi Arabian government, society, and economy to go very small, very specific, and very local to start. Rather than thinking on the, uh, always thinking on the notion of national policies, those are important, but at the same time as we pursue those goals, we have to cultivate young entrepreneurial leaders today. And it's easier to get 10 or 12 people the resources that they need to succeed and become mentors, become uh, people that others can look up to, than it is to do that at a countrywide scale. That requires giving them connections, giving them mentorship, giving them capital, and most importantly, perhaps giving them a sense of camaraderie. Because entrepreneur entrepreneurship is difficult, it's not something that everyone is, is up for doing, and it needs to be something that a community is built, is, is, is built in if it's going to ever really flourish or succeed. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We had uh, in the agenda at the time for Q&A, and we had the signs of uh, 10 to 15 minutes, but we're running very late on, on um, our time, so we've got about five minutes. Uh, I wanted to ask Farid, because I noticed how popular uh, lots of the programs you, uh, you mentioned. If we wanted to, uh, a quick win, 
keeping in mind the difference in size of uh, and number of entrepreneurs between the two countries. What could be, uh, from your experience, quick wins uh, for support for young entrepreneurs in Saudi Arabia? Well, uh, the things that had the biggest impact maybe in Dubai are? بصراحة دعم القيادة هذا أهم شيء في تنمية ريادة الأعمال في أي دولة. يعني قد ما الموظفين والدوائر تحاول إذا ما كان في دعم يعني دعم ومتابعة من القيادة يعني المشكلة أن المفروض أن أي مشروع يعني يبني مستوى معين من الثقة بينه وبين المشترين ليشتروا منه فإذا ما كانت هذه الثقة موجودة أو ما حد ساعدهم في بناء هذه الثقة لهم أو إعطاهم الثقة هذه الناس من الصعب أنهم يستمروا فاستمرارية المشروع يعني مهمة جدا أنا بصراحة يمكن أول مرة أرتكي مع البنات في السعودية يعني ما شاء الله شفت فريق العمل بقيادة أختنا حنة من غرفة تجارة صناعة جدة ما شاء الله فريق عمل جدا متميز وأنا فخور بالمجموعة اللي شفتم هنا وأريد أقول لكم يا شباب إذا ما تحركتوا ترامب بيغلبونكم نعم شكرا Chris, uh, how do you see social media uh, and its effect for or opportunity for entrepreneurship in uh, for youth entrepreneurship? Is it? Do you see that this is a a, a catalyst or a, a good idea? Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I think it is. I mean, I was just uh, we were talking earlier backstage. I mean, Saudi Arabia has one of the most active social media pop, uh, populations for the number of people who are connected to the internet here, which is uh, which is wonderful. A couple of things on social media. I mean, social media is a large concept that's constantly evolving and constantly changing. It's been nearly it's been over now ten years since we started. Facebook, and since then we've seen the emergence of all kinds of other networks, global networks, uh, whether it's Twitter or LinkedIn or more recent arrivals like uh, Snapchat or, uh, or WhatsApp and others. So social media is constantly evolving and it's still a very fertile ground for lots of innovation and uh, experimentation. I think particularly uh, in a place like this, social media is an important way for uh, people who are just starting to think about new companies, new ideas, new, uh, new enterprises to create, to share them, get initial feedback from friends, family, and, and be a way to connect them to potential investors and mentors and advisors. That requires that the entrepreneur uses the networks proactively and reaches out to the people that they you know, uh, respect and, and admire and even need help, uh, need help from. Um, but as long as, as as long as social media creates this, it's not a c totally level playing field, but certainly makes it a more level playing field than it was before. Then I think it'll be a good thing to encourage more more innovation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry we don't have enough time to uh, go into more Q and A. Uh, we're going to present four questions or four statements for the attendance and we'd like for you to uh, vote if you agree or disagree with this the first one entrepreneurship is the answer to the youth employment crisis do you agree or disagree Next question. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so 90 percent. Says yes. Good. Agree. <laughs> okay. Saudi big business must be must do more to invest in young entrepreneurs. You agree or disagree? I guess we don't get to vote. <laughs> <laughs> So I see 93% agree. Next statement. More must be done to support female entrepreneurs. Do you agree or disagree? Eighty-five percent of attendants agree. Entrepreneurship must form a formal part of the education curriculum. Agree or disagree? Ninety-three percent agree. Finally, the last statement, more must be done to instill critical thinking and problem-solving skills in young people in education. Ninety-three percent agree. Well, thank you very much for the uh, panelists. Uh, uh, thank you. شكرا للمهندس رضا اسلام وللساده المشاركين في جلسه رياده الاعمال التحديات وعوامل التمكين ادعو الان السيد عدنان مندوره الامين العام للغرفه التجاريه والصناعيه بجده لتكريم الساده المشاركين يبدو أستاذ المشاركين استعجلوا مغادرة المسرح عندهم التزامات أخرى وربما للمواضيع الهامة والرئيسية التي طرحت في هذه الجلسة نشكرهم مرة أخرى وخلال هذا التكريم نذكركم فقط بالأجهزة التي بين يديكم الجهاز الأول هو باور بوت 
والذي تستطيعون المشاركة من خلاله في كل جلسة على حدة للتصويت على الاستفتاء الذي يعرض في نهاية كل جلسة وقد صوت بعضكم على الاستفتاء الذي كان قبل قليل ونظرا لكثرة عدد الحضور وقلة المصوتين نتمنى منكم الحصول على هذا الجهاز من خارج القاعة للمشاركة في التصويت في نهاية كل جلسة أيضا هناك جهاز آخر تحدثنا عنه بالأمس وهو جهاز فوكن هذا الجهاز يتيح لكم المجال للتصويت على عدد من النقاط البارزة المتعلقة بكل جلسة والمشاركة فيها أيضا حتى على المشاركين في الجلسات ومدى أدائهم وهذا التصويت سري كما بإمكانكم الاحتفاظ بهذا الجهاز الذي اسمه فوكن الذي قد يمثل كرت تعريف شخصي بكم وبإمكانكم أيضا الحصول على هذا الجهاز من خارج القاعة والاحتفاظ به وهناك جدار استفتائي إذا صحت التسمية بإمكانكم التصويت مباشرة على الجلسات والمشاركة في الرأي بشانها شكراً للأستاذ عدنان مندور جلستنا المقبلة تحت عنوان تلبية احتياجات الشباب دور التعليم في تطوير المهارات المطلوبة في العمل وهي من تنظيم جامعة الأعمال والتكنولوجيا الأهلية بجد